This is Lynn Fraser with the Kilby Center for Recovery in our Radical Recovery series. And today we're talking with Dr. Bob Weathers. Hmm. I'm going to let Bob introduce himself and we're going to get into a little bit about his story and his work with integral recovery and shame and all kinds of elements and nuances of the journey of recovery. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, mm -hmm. Bob. Lynn, I'm happy to be here with you. It's a real honor to be with you. Just having met Scott a few weeks ago on another podcast and being deeply moved by that, as you know, I reported on that online and I'm really happy to have corresponded with you and I feel your spirit as well. So I'm really honored to be here today. Um, this is by what, yeah, thank you. Uh, by way of brief introduction, then we can go more deeply into this for sure. Um, uh, my background, my doctorate's in clinical psychology, and there's a whole story around that. I, I completed my doctorate uh, about 30 years ago, and um, uh, my doctoral dissertation was in mindfulness meditation. And in those days, there weren't a lot of dissertations on mindfulness meditation. It's become quite the hot topic over the years, as sometimes it goes. I've been a lifelong drummer, and I found it really interesting in the late 80s when the men's movement kind of burgeoned into, let's all drum. And I remember thinking to myself, there'll be about 15 minutes of this being really cool, and then it will go back to me drumming alone again. <laughs> and, and I don't know how that will go with mindfulness, but uh, I, I love drumming and I love mindfulness, but I realize that right now we're kind of on the ascendant with uh, mindfulness all over all over the media and so on. Mm -hmm. So I did my doctoral dissertation on mindfulness. It's one of these things, it's almost, it kind of presaged my career, is that what I was looking at were unpleasant experiences that get evoked in meditative experience. There was a ton of material on the transformative aspects, all, all love and light and so on, but less on the shadow side of it. And I was deeply committed at this point. I was early on in my practice, about five years into practicing it. And, uh, and, and have experienced both sides, and especially my background in clinical psychology, suggested that this would be an area I'd like to look at. So I did that work all those years ago. And just the, 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 the quick story, and then we can go more into depth, is that I, I continued to meditate um, actively all, all these years. I, I, I taught in graduate schools in clinical psychology here in Southern California. Um, really loved doing that. Uh, I chaired doctoral dissertations on similar topics around spirituality and, uh, and spiritual practice, including meditation. And uh, then my life took a really leftward turn, and I can, I can go into more detail, just enough to say that I, I, I'm, I'm kind of a statistical exception, Lynn, insofar as I encountered addiction in midlife. Uh, obviously, it can happen because it happened to me, but statistically, it's quite, uh, quite uh, kind of an outlier phenomenon. And so I tell people I'd never smoked a cigarette until I was age 45, to give you an idea of how kind of lily white I had, had been in my life, which is when I talk to groups of, of uh, individuals seeking recovery from addiction, I don't even like to brag about that because it kind of offends them. It's like, how is that possible? <laughs> but as I also share with them and I share with you today, is that then when I got into addiction, it started with alcohol, increasing alcohol use, and then eventually recreational drugs, so-called recreational drugs like cocaine. In fact, I was thinking recently about recreational. I was trying to recreate something, and it really wasn't, this wasn't just for fun. There was something really going on inside in terms of inner stirrings, both spiritual and psychologically, trauma that had never been dealt with, spiritual longings that had yet to be born out that I was really trying to create something, probably better to say create than recreate. And then it advanced from that into the, the darker phase for me was being addicted to both alcohol and also prescription drugs and particular sedatives. I got, just got my lock, myself locked into a, uh, a, a, the chemistry of all of that. It wasn't, this wasn't for fun anymore, it was just to maintain. And that was really when it got scary for me, but that was, um, that was 10, 15 years down the road. And so I entered into recovery uh, about 10 years ago and have maintained absence for the last a little bit over five years mm -hmm. and have been really deeply committed and we'll talk about all of that more. I do want to say here at the outset because I think it sets the tone for talking about shame and some of the things that have really I found useful both personally as well as professionally is that I, I had great losses. Uh, I lost my career as a university professor owing to the ill effects of um, poor decisions, et cetera, catastrophically poor decisions made that lost me my uh, tenured academic position. And it was incredibly painful to me because I loved teaching and I was beloved. It was just like one of these things that, there's a few things I feel like I'm really born to do. Drumming is one of them, <laughs> teaching right. is another one. Right. And to lose that was horrible. And 
honestly, this is no excuse at all. But within the next two years, I had repeated, I, I got involved with a former client uh, 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 that I'd worked with for a few weeks. Um, and uh, we got married. We got married. But, uh, you know, as most people are well aware in, in psychology and other mental health disciplines, uh, uh, that's a no-no. And I, and I was fully aware of it as much as you can be fully aware of it in, in increasing addiction. And I don't make any excuses because it's horrible uh, uh, trauma for everybody involved. Um, but I, I, I then ended up losing my license a little over 10 years ago in psychology. And so uh, I practiced for 30 years as a psychologist. I was in academics, have continued, by the way, in academic psychology, continued to the present time, uh, working in administration at, at a local online university. But my passion, and that's what brings us together, Lynn, my passion has been uh, my own recovery to start with, for sure. And then um, wanting to help others not go down the same road to be really honest about it it's some combination of extreme selfishness and and utter altruism they're both linked together for me um, and and so i think i just to underscore that last piece when i when i share my story with clients i run groups every week at a local treatment center when i share my story and as i shared with you earlier that's new for me newer for me uh, you know in the last couple of years i've, I've begun to feel more okay with that in fact uh, in February, I'm speaking to the California Association of Marriage and Family Therapists about my story. You want to talk about a radical coming out. That's a radical coming out for me in an environment uh, that, uh, that although I was in psychology, these are, these are, these are uh, graduate level clinicians, licensed people, and it feels very vulnerable to do that. And it might well go sideways, but I feel a burning, burning need to uh, help get the word out in terms of some of the things that, that I found useful and things I didn't find useful. And also just to, um, as much as I can, to kind of unshame or destigmatize addiction because it's so rampant. So, so when I talked, I was saying, when I talked to addicts uh, early in recovery about this, there's not a one of them that doesn't feel moved by it because every one of them has lost something tantamount to what I've lost, whether it's a career and or marriage and family. Uh, and or legal rights, even the capacity to drive and have other legal freedoms and so on. And so it, it immediately universalizes the conversation when I introduce this. It's, um, it's not shocking to the clients that I present it to. I, I end up being sensitive, and you know because we talked about this, because it can be shocking to somebody that doesn't know addiction from the inside. The, the, the problem is, or I don't know if it's a problem, the, the reality is, is that all of us know addiction, at least indirectly, because it's so rampant that we have it in our families. And, um, and I'm hoping to, I'm hoping to uh, open up the conversation so it not be lurking in the shadows. And I certainly know about how that went for me, and I can talk more about that later, in terms of how my addiction was actually sustained by my shame about coming out, even to fellow, um, all of my friends were psychologists, Lynn, okay. and uh, virtually none of them knew about what was going on, because, because to be out with my addiction, at least in the, in the discipline of psychology, is, uh, is to commit professional suicide. That's actually, I had one, one friend refer to it as that, is that you can't, you, there's uh, psychology at this point, doesn't have a rehabilitation arm or a um, diversion program. Medicine does, law does, dentistry does, nursing does, the military does. Psychology, ironically, <laughs> of all professions, does not yet. There's good news there is that I've been contacted by uh, uh, individuals at Duke and uh, University and University of North Carolina that are part of the American Psychological Association. They're wanting to address that. And I was afraid they were wanting to make me their poster child <laughs> to, to bring this out. And uh, that conversation ended a year ago when I went back before the board after almost 10 years had gone by and the board decided not to relicense me, not to. There is a, there is, there is a formal rehabilitation process. There's not a, a particularly psychological process involved, but I went through that and complied with that, and um, they believed I hadn't been in recovery long enough, oh. um, and so they, they turned it down, and that's their prerogative. Um, uh, so, so I do the work that I do. I do it now as a recovery coach. I no longer operate as a psychologist. I can't say I'm a psychologist. Uh, my PhD in clinical psychology stands, but my formal recognition as a clinical psychologist is not possible anymore. So I feel very deeply called to the work that I do these days. It really dominates every day right through our conversation now. I care so much about being here with you right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. Gosh, there's so much that's coming up for me as I was listening to you. Uh, 
I'd love to <laughs> dialogue. Yeah, yeah. One of them is is connected to transparency and denial. Hmm. And so obviously the the whole profession of psychology is is in some kind of form of denial around addiction and recovery for their members. And you know I can see why. Mm -hmm. um, you know there's the whole dynamic of the wounded healer and how much healing do we need to have before we're trustworthy and yes, yes there are so many dynamics there yeah. but what was like that, what was that like for you as you were as you were getting deeper into your addiction and were you completely blocking out how how bad it had gotten what were you kind of getting that feeling but actively hiding it what was that dynamic like that last few years before you hit bottom mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. There's lots of different ways to go. I'll try to just summarize a few. I don't know that this will be comprehensive. I think it's implied in my comment earlier about smoking and beginning in midlife. I really was, um, I hate this word, but I'm going to use it because it's been used about me. I was really a goody two-shoes most all of my life. Yep. I grew up, for example, with two older brothers that grew up in the late 60s. Both of them went to UC Berkeley at the height of kind of the summer of love. And I was a little... Uh, grade school boy going with them up there <laughs> and imprinting on on uh, all of that and and uh, both of them got very involved in drugs including hallucinogenics and in fact a real burden for me in all of this work something that's really motivated me prior because i've worked in and around addiction for 40 years if you work in psychology you are working with addiction uh, uh, the uh, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, just last year published a study that, that, that uh, suggested that up to 50% of clients that walk in the door to see a therapist are actively clinically addicted to substance. And that was just including alcohol and other drugs. Uh, didn't include nicotine. If you, if you add it, 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 so it's, it's just oh, a it rampant include, problem. That's just substance abuse. It's, it's, it's probably didn't include gambling. No, no, no. The, none of the process addictions. This is just substance addiction. This is substance use disorders up to 50%. There's a, there's a, there's a range in there. And I have to tell you that over, you know, 30, 40 years of clinical practice that matches my experience. It's not to say that people walk in saying I'm addicted to alcohol or I've got a problem with prescription painkillers. They'll come in with marital problems or work-related problems um, or parent, you know, those kinds of things. But what will come out over time is, is that it'll eventually arise kind of organically because people will even deny when asked early on. So I tell you that story because that's my story is that there, I was a goody two shoes and I, uh, I'd lived this kind of lily white life in whatever way and whenever the shadow broke through it broke through in kind of equal and opposite strength <laughs> it was just bam wow. and it manifested as addictive behaviors and it started off uh, in so-called partying mode but it was extreme and even that was suspect in my psychological cohort and so uh, there were some examples of joining with my friends but I began having friends that were outside of psychology because psychology at least the group that I was involved with has almost a puritanical quality to it and that's not all bad but I was very identified with that until I wasn't and then it really didn't work for me and so there's a couple of things that happened for me one is that there's there's the shame of realizing the uh, the uh, the risk I have of being excluded from the group is that if I'm out with this it's going to be a major problem so I went underground that way there's also the uh, the personal shame aside from psychology which is I still have this feeling Lynn I have to tell you Sometimes I wake up and I go, how is this, is this Bob Weathers' life? <laughs> to put it more to the point, is this Bobby Weathers' life? Because mm -hmm. yeah. Bobby Weathers, I just, yeah, it's just, I, I was talking about my two older brothers going up and getting involved in drugs. And my oldest brother was a, was a casualty of hallucinogens wow. and we really lost him. And so it's been a central source of pain for me my entire life. I'm and sorry. so when I got in, when I got into psychology, I was very motivated to try to help others, and it was born out of my love for Tony. I just uh, felt a very conscious connection to Tony. Um, and it steered me away, actually, in the early years because of the, uh, the cost to my two oldest brothers, particularly, was in my face. And, uh, 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 and so when I got involved in midlife, there was horrible self-incrimination. It's like, what the hell are you doing? Oh, there was... There was that still small voice, always has been. In fact, I've talked to clients about this. On the cusp of shooting a needle in your arm or snorting of this or puffing of that, 
Have you experienced having this voice that kind of wages war with that? It's not universal, but this, the majority of people will raise their hand so we can talk into it, that even amidst active addiction, for me, and I, and I found with, with these clients, most of my clients that I currently work with have uh, long-term histories of uh, meth or heroin addiction, so very serious addictions. Even amidst that, there's a, there's a voice of integrity, or you might say conscience. I certainly had that, and it was associated then with, with feeling awful about myself, all the more reason to continue. And so uh, I, would, I would use uh, to, in some ways, to kind of diminish that. And, and then there's a third part, and I'll, I'll finish my answer to your question with this, is that then there's just the function of what happens to the human brain in addiction. What happens to Bob Weathers' brain in addiction? And so, uh, you know, you, you begin to lose traction. I know you know this well, but I certainly did in my own life. Began to lose perspective and made some choices in this time. Two of the ones that I'm talking about that were career uh, uh, ending for me, made choices that actually made sense in a certain state of mind. They look completely imbecile. Uh, outside of that, out, outside of that state, and it's been a lot of work to move through the shame that followed on, you know, getting clean and clear of all of that, and looking back and going, "What has God wrought?" <laughs> it's just like and having to work with that, and it nearly took me out in early recovery. It wasn't an active addiction; it was an early recovery. That the that the, the incredible uh, uh, shaming voices came in. That there's something fundamentally wrong, broken, and bad about me, and it nearly took me out. I think I think that that was the worst part for me, and I think it got me into, on in a very personal level, addressing shame and stigma in recovery because it was so uh, central for me. Uh, as I work with clients, it seems to be that also seems to be almost a unanimous kind of experience. Oh, yeah, but it's uh, it's ironic. I, th I thought it was in recovery. It was going to get better. It actually got far worse subjectively in the early days of recovery. So, well, you know, I think that's a very important point for people to know is that mm. as they're early in recovery, the shame is most likely going to come up. Yeah, it's it did for me. Something yeah. wrong with that yeah. process. That's a natural process. Yeah. So yeah. what would you advise or how do you work with people that are in that mm. shame stigma yeah. pool? I think I, I sometimes I think that sometimes the work I do is so autobiographical, so I have to own up to that. Okay, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. But, but I'll, I'll tell you, when I met with Scott a few weeks ago for our podcast, I was so deeply moved by him. Mm -hmm. You have to know, I was just really touched by his presence, and he shared enough of his story to know that it has roots all the way down for him. The 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 the. the uh, the way he moves with addiction and the way he uh, hosts recovery, all of that is so, it feels like it's just one of those examples of it, it, how do you separate out Scott from what he's doing, it, it, his soul and his spirit. It's just, I didn't, I don't have words for it even now, but it was so apparent uh, to me and I was so deeply touched by that. And I, I, I don't uh, pretend to be Scott. In fact, that's kind of the point. I'm Bob. And, oh, right, and right. what I do, what I do is, is kind of who I am. <laughs> and, and, uh, so how that, how that goes for me, I'll, I'll tell you how it went for me very early in recovery. I went, I uh, was in a hospital detox unit, realized I had lost everything. I'd lost my relationship, I, my central relationship, the woman that I'm now married to, we weren't married at the time. I'd lost, I had lost yet another career. I had lost all finances, all respect, et cetera. And um, there were two things that happened to me there that, that I, yeah, there's two things. I was thinking of one thing, but there's two things. The one thing is implied in what I just told you, Lynn, is that there was such a radical leveling, a radical leveling of everything that I was attached to. I remember writing uh, voluminous notes there, and it was really a function of my brain chemistry. I was fully manic, I'm sure, but just manically writing. I just wrote volumes. You know? And uh, it was so bad that when I left, I realized the nature of what I'd done, and I threw it all away. I just felt like this, and now I regret that, but I just, I was so embarrassed by the obvious mania with which right. I was writing. Right. Having said that, there was a lot coursing through. And one of the things I remember writing that's never been forgotten is I remember being in the, in the, the detox unit, and there I was with, with my addictive history. When I would share it in groups, people would almost laugh at me because, again, I, I was with people that had serious long-term heroin addictions. Uh, and meth addictions and so on. And that had been my course. Mine was more white collar. And I don't think it makes any difference, but it did in that environment. And I, and I, and I, I there I was 
and I felt identified. These were my people. These were my people. And I really felt that. And I remember journaling at Lynn where I said, there'll come a day uh, in the not so distant future where I'll actually feel nostalgic for this. And the nostalgia wouldn't be for the, the suffering and all of the loss, but the nostalgia would be for the clarification that came on being emptied of all, period, <laughs> emptied of all. I just, I really, I had that sense. And I have to tell you that soon enough, as the months went by and the years have gone by in recovery, there's something about that purity of being completely absented of self that, that isn't a bad place to start. And I, and I felt it even there. There was some kind of liberation. And it's, I think maybe the only people that understand this are people that had maybe experienced close encounters with death. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and, and in my case with addiction, which is its own form of death, or some other catastrophic loss. And I, I haven't talked enough with people to get a sense of this. I do know my experience. And occasionally, I, I do share this in groups that I lead. And there will always be uh, one or two individuals that go, I know totally what you're talking about, Bob. They know totally what I'm talking about. And uh, that part felt, uh, felt and continues to feel deeply spiritual to me. And so in terms of, of answering your question about what I found useful or helpful for myself as well as with clients, uh, it, it uh, suggests very strongly the need for a spiritual writing, a spiritual um, grounding or centering of some kind. And, and I, I think that's as much graced as it is um, disciplined. You know, I think there's a lot of value to the spiritual disciplines and so on. And I'm committed to them mm -hmm. more on than off. But mm -hmm. I feel like that what I'm talking to you was given. It, 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 this, this awareness was given. I don't feel like that it was a function of formula or medications or cognitive behavioral exercises or 12 step this or with no disrespect to any of that, it was given. So that's, that's a piece that I wasn't thinking that I was gonna share with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's a surprise. Um, I think what's so interesting about that is that mm -hmm. quite often when people are in the midst of a catastrophe like that, there's yes. so much fear and yeah. so much compulsion in the thinking process that they yeah. really can't access that, mm -hmm. what you're talking about. So that it's not everybody's mm -hmm. experience, but what a wonderful experience of, of emptying mm -hmm. out and of, I mean, everything was gone. Mm -hmm. And somehow you opened into that. You know, it's been with me my whole life, Lynn. I wonder how this has gone for you. Um, that faced, I can just, as soon as you say that, I can kind of go back across my life at these very nodal, just a handful of them across the life, nodal instances of loss or just extreme stress, uh, in some cases trauma. Um, that it's, it's the one time, I don't even, I hate to even say it, because it's not anything I do. It's the one time that I am given the grace of dropping into this awareness. And I've had this across my life and, and my, my private uh, remorse is that I can't seem to carry it more consciously on a day-to-day, moment-to-moment -moment basis. But it's given me, and I really understand what you're saying, is that uh, I like the way that Eckhart Tolle talks about this, is that given in a vast amount of stress, most people will contract, but there's the possibility of opening and letting go into that. And I certainly have done my complete fair share of contraction, don't get me wrong, but this is one of those moments of opening for me and surrender. And uh, it, feels very, it feels very given, very grace. There's another piece I wanna mention that, that's gonna sound very left-brained in comparison to what I just shared with you. And I think there's room for both. <laughs> There always is. Both sides. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Is that uh, for me, the, the rhetoric that was used in the hospital, I hope not to step on toes with this, but the rhetoric that was used in the hospital was, was uh, primarily from a traditional religious perspective, insinuated in very self-help groups. I'll just leave it at that. And uh, owing, to the, owing to a number of things, not the least of which is I'd done a vast amount of study in religion, including world religions. I, uh, my doctorate's in clinical psychology, but part of my program, I got a master's in religious studies, and I had undergraduate degrees in both psychology and religious studies. And so just that alone would have opened me up to much more complex views of uh, spirituality, let's say. Uh, but I don't think that's the biggest part. I think the biggest part is the fact that I've been committed for decades to uh, spiritual practice, particularly some variation on mindfulness meditation. I've done this for decades. 
and had been involved for decades in Jungian analysis, working with dreams and the unconscious. And so for me to have very kind of pat, traditional, pre, pre-scientific, pre-modern categories put on my addiction, it just was a really, really bad fit for me. And nothing against all, uh, all of those who, who, for whom it's been instrumental in their, their recovery. It's, it's not about that at all. It's just that it was a really bad fit for me. And so what saved my butt, <laughs> <laughs> literally in the hospital, was was the psychiatrist on charge, Dr. Jonathan Reitman, who came in and sat with me individually as well as in groups and discussed what goes on in the brain around addiction. Oh. And that's going to seem like an odd thing uh, to bring up here, except that I was so mortified with myself and my my condition. On the one hand, there was this openness, but there was plenty of contraction as well. And I needed some way to organize this. And for me, uh, uh, that uh, scientific or medical understanding of explaining what goes on in the brain, a biological perspective on addiction, uh, was hugely important in my finding objectivity with this rather than being sunk by the subjectivity of it. And so I've been really dedicated. I'm not a brain scientist by nature. (laughs) I've really been dedicated over the last 10 years to learning all that I can well enough and then translate it into English. And so when I'm working with individuals early in recovery and talking and, and addressing shame, I'll bring in information because I feel like that that information for me was psychoactive and it might well be for them. And it seems the response is positive to that for the most part, not always. There are those for whom it, it creates too much conflict because it does, the information I predict, uh, present does in some ways conflict with another message they're getting, which is that the way to go is a, is a spiritual approach. And it's, uh, in my view, it would be a traditional or pre-modern spiritual approach at that. And so uh, I can't do what I'm not. And I, I'll tell you one thing is that I, I, I certainly have learned personally as well as professionally to embrace uh, diversity absolutely and so I don't have any in fact it's it's it it lands hard for me I can think of a client not so long ago a couple months ago that was talking about the conflict he experienced sitting in my groups as I was talking about brain science and addiction and I, and I, I know my response to him and the heart that it came from is that I would never want to uh, trouble or trip you up in this if it's not useful to you it's fine with me that you don't you don't have to stay in the group i i said i i i bless whatever is working for you because he did find another pathway was working for him so that's really my heart but what i can bring what i can contribute is a function of my own uh preferences and limitations i guess so so some combination of of kind of radical spirituality on the one hand i think Mm -hmm. and on the other hand uh uh very kind of steeped in science, left brain information, and there's more, but it's, I, I think that that makes it, that's enough adequate for me in terms of what I can bring in some combination. Now, I interrupted you, or I talked over you. What no, that's okay. So what, I, what I'd like to do is, is kind of circle back now to trauma. The, yeah. the, 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 what I have found, too, is exactly what you just said. People have, we form beliefs about ourselves based on our experience. Yeah. And to have somebody with some authority say, actually, this is how it works. Mm-hmm. This isn't something that you're doing wrong or, mm-hmm. you know, and so if we could circle back to trauma, yeah. early childhood trauma in particular, and you mentioned yeah. at the beginning that there was a lot yeah. of trauma that hadn't been dealt with and that mm-hmm. it lingered in the background mm-hmm. and that that's what eventually drove yeah. the yeah. issue of addiction. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you, you make me think of a PowerPoint slide. When I started off uh, in this latest incarnation working in addiction, as I said, I've worked in addiction and recovery for 40 years from the very beginning, my very first job in mental health, and for 30 years as a psychologist, and 15 years ago was hired to be the clinical director of a brand new rehab out of Malibu called Passages. And uh, I was at the very beginning, and so that was my really kind of my immersion in this. And then the last 10 years of my own recovery. So it's kind of, there's layers and layers and layers. Um, uh, remind me of your question right now, because I just got off track with my telling all of those years. It, it brings up specific images for me, my very first job and so on. Remind yeah, yeah. me of your question. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, that's okay. It's, it's just around, um, we went from education yeah, and letting yeah, people know yeah. into how that works yeah. with trauma and how yeah. that was kind of underlying your own addiction. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.
give me just a second to organize my thoughts. I've thought a lot about this and I feel deeply about this. One of the, one of the images that I show to the clients is a PowerPoint image and it's just of a, it's of a kind of a vicious cycle, a, a diagram. And a, underneath it, the caption is the poor get poorer. And uh, I compensate later by suggesting the rich get richer, but that's another story for a little bit later perhaps. And my thought about it for myself personally, as well as uh, what I know from the literature and from my uh, years of work, is that, uh, that uh, you know, you're familiar with the ACE studies, the Adverse Childhood Experience studies, that virtually 100% of those that struggle with clinically significant addiction, whether it's to substance or to behavior, uh, have statistically higher levels of childhood trauma. It's just, uh, I'll ask in groups, uh, we have a fair bit of freedom in our groups. I think it's helped by the transparency there. And people will raise their hands and almost always uh, in a group, everyone except maybe one person will raise their hand talking about, they suspect that they had adverse childhood experiences that set them apart. And, and I'll usually discuss the one person as being the exception that proves the rule, because I don't doubt that there are exceptions to that. I'm in, the, I'm in the former group. I'm in the group that experienced adverse childhood experiences for sure. There's no one that knows my family story that would go, wow, that, that's your normal family background. It's, it just wasn't. It's what I knew. It's what I knew. But it, it laid down blueprints. And the idea of the poor getting poorer is that, it, is that that adverse childhood experience for me and for others, it lays down... Uh, uh, patterns or expectations and vulnerabilities early on that if not dealt with will will rise up later and manifest in different forms and one of those forms um, one of the the uh, experts in trauma theory John Briere talks about tension reducing behaviors will find some way to reduce the anxiety the depression the other the other kinds of distress that arise from uh, long-term unworked through childhood trauma will find ways to reduce the tension so people acted out with anger Mm -hmm. uh, I acted it out in, in mid-adulthood with, I, in fact, let me start, I acted it out earlier in my life by just being compulsively working all the time. I mean, I, I, that, that seemed to be marvelously adaptive. Bob just works all the time. It got me through a doctoral program. It got me into my career in academics. And, and, and then, I, then, I, then I began using, that wasn't working enough. And so I had to introduce other TRBs, other tension-reducing behaviors. And, and my understanding is it's a way to manage, I'll, I'll, to be specific about it, Adverse childhood experience predisposes our biologies to higher levels of stress hormones, uh, cortisol and adrenaline. We just carry that with us. <clears throat> and that becomes kind of the set point. I had a nurse years ago that said to me, Bob, I cannot possibly barbecue in my own adrenaline. And I've never forgotten that phrase, the idea that having that high a level, there's none of us that can sustain that. The body erodes, the psyche, the emotions, the relationships, all of that. And so this is where addiction comes in. And so if, if I become behaviorally addicted to working too much or to sex or to gambling or to eating, there's all any possible manifestation there we can be addicted to to reduce tension. And for me, it was in substances and it started off with alcohol. That's amazing. Um, let me tell you a story, Lynn, because this, this, this will get right out the, the childhood trauma component. When I was 18 years old, I graduated from high school. I never drank any alcohol throughout high school. And you'd think, well, that must, he must come from a conservative religious background. I, it, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, but, I, but I had started as a very young boy uh, in music. Both my parents were amateur musicians. I started in music. And so I started playing piano very young. And then as soon as I was old enough to switch, I switched to drums. I started drumming <clears throat> a long time ago. 50, is it possible that it's over 50 years ago? Yeah, it is, it's 55 years ago. <laughs> That's crazy. I think my parents were very disappointed. I think they thought, Bobby will outgrow this. <laughs> <laughs> but drumming provided, I didn't have any language for this, but music and drumming provided an outlet for me. And I'm sure it's the way that I managed what was going on in the household, which is really traumatic. Uh, uh, and that really sustained me through, uh, through adolescence. That in athletics, I was involved in sports. I played a lot of competitive tennis and that was another outlet and I'm very grateful. I used to tease and tell people that it was drumming and tennis that kept me from killing somebody. And that's probably a bit over the top, but I, it, it was a way of managing things. Yeah. So right after high school, I graduated and went to Europe uh, for a study tour. And I had my first uh, glass of alcohol. It was on the, the ferry coming from 
Dover to Calais. I remember drinking a lemon shandy. I'd never had any alcohol and I drank a whole glass of it. And within a few minutes, I remember I was sitting by myself on the boat and I remember thinking to myself, this is amazing. You can drink drumming in a bottle. Oh. It was my first awareness that it was possible to get that feeling I get. I still get it with drumming. I'm still active as a drummer, mm -hmm. but I could get it quickly. You know, you have to drum for a couple hours sometimes to get to that place <laughs> and you get blisters and it's noisy and alcohol is so convenient. And so it is, uh, and it that was, yeah, and it worked and it worked. And so, so I, I think, I think that little Bobby, 18 year old Bobby at that point was having his first taste of something that would help calm the demons inside. And I had been very active in, in high school academically, as well as sports, as well as music, et cetera, et cetera, and pull out all the stops. And it wasn't, it wasn't working. I had to add more and more to it. I think what I did is I added academics in terms of, you know, extended academics after that, that kept me just kind of being in this kind of workaholic place for many years, all the way through my twenties. Um, I can't imagine what it's like to, to uh, with most of my clients who, who began addictive uh, uh, relationship to substances at age 12 or 13. That came much later for me, uh, but I did have this first taste at eight, age 18. If I hadn't had these other things in place, I can well imagine that I would have been an incredible candidate for going down that same path. But I, I think the way that this goes is that we have we we do whatever we can to manage, and I think addiction is near the top of the list in terms of ways of managing the childhood trauma. Uh, what I find is I'm working right now with with young men and women, primarily men, um, at the treatment center that are in their probably uh, the modal age is probably 25 to 35, somewhere in that range, and as they begin to get sober out comes all of the unworked through stuff. And, and I certainly relate to that personally. That's how it went for me. Um, and it, it, I've, I've worked for years with a therapist who says it this way, Bob, you'll either deal with that stuff through the front door that is more intentionally or consciously, or it will come in through the back door. Yeah. And I think that the, the back door would be the addictions and or the, 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 um, the, the way these demons arise, for example, interpersonally and so on. Is that a start in the direction of addressing what you're asking, Lynn? Mm -hmm. Happy to go wherever you want to with this. Well, and it's um, one of the things that Scott noticed right away at the Killaby Center was that trauma was at the root of all of the mm -hmm. addiction. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and so that's what they start their trauma first treatment center. And yeah. that's not the case with a lot of treatment centers. Mm -hmm. I have a thought of. I have a thought about that I want to share with you. And this also is, is uh, like, likely to step on some toes, and I don't intend any harm in this, but I want to respond I'm very much in sync with you and what, what Scott has done. It came to me just a few months ago. I've been involved in refuge recovery since the beginning of my recovery, which is uh, an organization that, that uh, I think kind of combines the best of the 12-step programs in a Buddhist context and also uh, puts right front and center meditation. And so I'm wired for sound. <laughs> <laughs> for refuge recovery. I can remember the first meeting I went to right out of the hospital and uh, up, in, up in Los Angeles. And I remember going into a room where I was easily old enough to be the grandfather of most of the people there, much less the father of it, just amazing. And uh, most people had tattoos and piercings. And I went home that night to, to Colleen, who's now my wife. And I said, I found my people. And I wasn't being facetious. It was like, those were my people. And it really has continued to feel like that to me. It's one organization, one community where I really feel that. <clears throat> mm. uh, uh, where were we going with it? I'm sorry. I just <laughs> got, dist got distracted again. Um, oh, oh, I know. It's about trauma. Is, is that... Uh, uh, in a recent meeting of Refuge Recovery, I shared what had come to me just that week, which is that with all due respect to the 12-step programs and its origins, <clears throat> that, that many of the principles and certainly the, the, the source text and so on, is uh, it's, um, it's pre-trauma theory. It was developed, you know, the, the development in, in research in psychology and trauma has just burgeoned in the last 20 to 30 years. Furthermore, it's pre-brain uh, scan technology. Just to understand, it's nothing against anybody. You just don't have access to that. It's only been the last 20 years that we've really come to understand the biology of addiction owing to technology. It's also uh, in regards to uh, 
another huge development in psychology, probably the, the, the primary uh, uh, theoretical orientation of psychology at this point is attachment theory. There was no attachment theory then, and, and a bit based on research on relationships and how instrumental they are to our psychological well-being, which ties indirectly uh, into trauma for sure. I even thought to myself, it's pre-war on drugs. It's pre-war on drugs in terms of all I've known since a kid, so about 1970 onward, is the, the legislating of how we deal with drugs. I'll tell you a story. My dad was a psychiatrist. Dad passed away five years ago uh, this Christmas. And uh, dad spent most of his career working in the penal system in California. He worked at Soledad. He worked at Vacaville, these various prison systems. But when I was a young boy growing up, dad worked in the state hospitals. And uh, 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 those were all deinstitutionalized in the late 60s here in California. And so dad went to work in the prison system. And he said, what I find in the prisons, Bobby, the people that used to be in state hospitals and receiving treatment are now incarcerated. <clears throat> That's significant. And, and with the war on drugs, what's happened is that that's become more and more the case. We put more and more money into incarcerating people so that 80% of people in prisons, as you know, at this point are there because of drugs. They were either selling, using, or seeking, you know. <clears throat> and so- the uh, Underlying the drug use is the trauma. Yeah, and so, and my father, because of his background in psychiatry, he rose kind of in the field to become more administrative, but he always felt this way. He felt like we're incarcerating people and not providing treatment, and underlying all of that would be the trauma. So the war on drugs, if you have a program that's pre-war on drugs, pre-trauma theory, pre-attachment theory, and pre-brain te technology, you've got a lot of important movements of information in the last uh, 20 to 30 years that if not integrated are gonna hamstring services, it seems like to me. So in that spirit then I wanna say, I heartily endorse uh, what you and Scott are doing at the Killaby Center. I, I, I feel exactly the same way as you. Some people would say that's your bias, Bob, because you're training us as a clinical psychologist, and I wouldn't disagree with that. And uh, one of the faults, if I can say this, of clinical psychology is it will tend to reduce everything to being down to, to being nothing but developmental disorders subsequent to trauma. And, and uh, it tends to be void of spirituality. I don't see it as an either or proposition. And I hardly uh, acknowledge that psychology needs to do its own work and getting up to snuff with that. But the opposite problem, which to me is spiritual bypassing, which is we'll bypass psychological trauma in favor of you getting yourself right with God and so on. It seems hopelessly naive to me if that's all you're standing on. And there are exceptions of people that I'm sure that can trans, uh, you know, Right. Yeah. Yeah. Can can do that immediately and get assumed into heaven, and that's wonderful. But that's not the people that I work with, and it's not it's not my own experience. Well, and that's what I think is so radical and mm -hmm. effective about Scott's approach is it's yeah. mindfulness based trauma yeah. first. Yes. And so you you've got the whole thing. Yeah, I feel exactly the same. He he articulated it so powerfully. It was as much in the silences with him as it was in what he spoke. I could feel it so strongly. And I had a chance to go back and review uh, uh, many of his podcasts, including with you, as well as read his most recent book to get more of a felt sense of it. And I, I just, it feels, it feels so familiar to me in terms of uh, resonating so deeply for me in terms of caring both and, you know, I'm, I'm, my background's in integral recovery, which looks at, at, for example, looks at addiction from four quadrants. And uh, those four quadrants simply are the biological <clears throat> is important. And if you, you know, if you'd met my dad, my dad was only a biologist. The problem was his dad wasn't all of that much of a therapist. And, and, and so uh, I come from a family of everybody in my family, except for me is in the medical profession. So there's that bias. And <clears throat> uh, in fact, Ken Wilbur, the, the founder of integral theory, calls that category error, where I reduce everything down to my category. Uh, Plato called it part whole error, where I reduce the whole down to the part that I see. The oh. Sufis talked about it in terms of the blind men and the elephant, you yeah. know, yes. depending on what you touch. It doesn't, it's, it's, it's human for us to do that. And so I can be indicted for looking at things through a traumatic psychological lens. And I, I, I have to constantly kind of correct for that. 
that integral theory would suggest that there's a biological perspective that's essential. And I've already shared with you how essential that was to me mm -hmm. in terms of just an understanding of biological perspective in terms of addressing another quadrant, which is the internal psychological perspective. It actually, good science helped inform my interior world in a way that helped to unshame me significantly. So I'm very grateful for that. My training is primarily in the quadrant dealing with the psychological. Uh, but within the psychological are multiple developmental lines, including spirituality. Uh, this is the place for me of, of developing an interior practice like mindfulness practice. For me, I don't see that as non-psychological. That plots itself right in that interior domain. Um, uh, one of the lacks for me, it seems like to me, in, in a lot of the recovery community is attention to a, a, another quadrant, which is the relational a quadrant where you separate out families from addicts and so on. And there's value in that. I don't disagree with that. But if you don't address what's going on in the home environment and do that with the, the best uh, means possible, and I'm a big proponent of family systems approaches to looking at, at addiction systemically as well as individually, if you don't address that or if you don't incorporate the findings of attachment theory, you're really stuck with a, uh, you're, you're almost guaranteed relapse in that environment because I'm fine in the rehab. <laughs> I've seen Jesus in the rehab. I go home and now all I see is hell. <laughs> yes, yeah. So that has to be addressed. And then, all the time. Yeah, that would be seen as the cultural component, the kind of the interior collective component in, in, uh, in uh, uh, integral theory. And then the final, the final of the four quadrants would be the, the societal. And uh, uh, I see this in my face every week when I work with clients. I've already shared with you my story. When I lost my career and was unemployable, uh, that's a financial problem. That's a societal issue. That's a, uh, I don't have access to uh, resources anymore. Uh, uh, I think issues of education, I think this, for me, this brings in uh, gender and sexual orientation uh, politics. Uh, all of that comes, uh, it, all of that is instrumental in, 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 uh, in addiction and in recovery, it seems like to me. It's the, it's the area that I'm least practiced in, and it's the one that I needed to do the most homework in because I'm the least familiar with kind of socioeconomic political perspective on addiction, which means all the more reason for me to be familiar with it. So I feel like it requires all of those. Having said that, my bias is in the, in the quadrant that we're talking about, which has to do with psychological trauma and being able to, uh, I, you can see how trauma affects the body. You can see how trauma affects our relationships. You can see how unworked through, through trauma manifests societally and politically. Uh, even internationally in terms of, of, of wars and violence and abuse and so on. So I, 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 I vote for the trauma quadrant. <laughs> <laughs> and I really support what you and Scott are doing uh, uh, in addressing that. In addressing it in a context that's really holistic. So it's not, um, it's not devoid of a profound spirituality. I'm so struck by his uh, philosophical depth and transparency. I don't even want to give a word to it because it's so powerful to me. Mm. Well, you know, a big part of the work that we do is to help people stay present with the sensations and the energy in their body. And that's something that I'm so thrilled to see is really moving out into psychology and into therapists yeah, now, yeah, is that yeah. recognition that it can't just be worked out in the head, it has to be yeah. in the body too. Yeah, yeah. So let's use an example of someone who is May I respond I real quickly? Oh, sure. May, yeah. Can I just respond real quickly to what you said? It'll slip by, and then I'm very happy yeah. to go with the, the next example. Is that when I mentioned earlier one of the limitations of pre-modern religion or traditional religion, one of its limitations is that it typically doesn't have an injunctive uh, uh, strand to it. And by injunctive, there's not a practice built into it. And so if you look at Western, for example, Judeo-Christian religion as one example, and it serves as the basis of some uh, very powerful self-help groups internationally, one of its limitations is it's got a very modest injunctive strand. And so we study about these uh, Jewish and Christian forefathers and mothers, but we don't know how they got to where they got to. There's no, there's no practice involved. And so to me, that's a central limitation. I'll talk about this more generally to be more generous around this, but to, to hear the words meditation used in certain self-help groups and to find how that's honored more in the breach than the observance, there's very little given to that, was extremely painful to me being so deeply uh, committed to, to meditative practice. I will say this, the meditative practice didn't save me from addiction now, did it? And that's where the trauma work 
needs to come in. But you can't ignore, to me, the, 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 the spiritual dimension, including practices that help to cultivate that. Having said that, and that would be an indictment of traditional recovery communities needing to update to, to my view, modern and even postmodern perspectives on spirituality. I feel exactly the same about psychology. Psychology can get so ensconced in its modernist scientific sensibility that it, does, that it forgets about uh, all else that, that's out there, including the, the other quadrants that I just mentioned, and specifically around spirituality can be incredibly anemic. Uh, spiritually. I happen to have gone to a program that integrated psychology and spirituality from the beginning. That's why I chose it all those years ago, and I'm very fortunate for that. But I have many colleagues who went to other programs that were completely absent of that. In fact, what you do with somebody that comes in with a spiritual hankering or a belief system is that you diagnose it. And that's really insanity to me. So, so there's, there's need for healing on, on, bo and on both ends, it seems. Now, you were going you were to move to another point or uh, an invitation, I think. So as you're as you're um, as we're talking about all of the elements of this, we bring in societal pressures. We bring in traumatic events as children, um, and one of the things that happens really, uh, really understandably and almost just very predictably is that we internalize it. We blame ourselves. Yes. We think there's something that we're doing wrong. Yes. Yes. That, yes. That we don't at that point understand, and children can't understand this flow of, of how it works, but we, mm -hmm. we want to reduce our suffering. So we go after things that either help us to numb it or we escape from it or we yeah. go into it, whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. And so now you're in a situation, I'm, I'm thinking now people listening. So someone has, uh, they're in recovery now and mm -hmm. they are starting to really open their eyes to their experience through their life. They're feeling a lot of shame and they really feel fundamentally there's something wrong with that. Yeah. yeah so could yeah, you address that? Yeah, yeah. This is the one that I care the most about. In fact, my eyes tear up with you asking the question, Lynn. I just feel so deeply about this this line right here. And I'll I'll share with you uh, experientially. Something I loved about Scott is he told this story. I mm. it, was, it wasn't talking theory. <laughs> it was great. And I, I hope that I'm not talking too much theory. I'm thinking of a psychologist, Kurt Lewin, who says, there's nothing so practical as a good theory. <laughs> and so theory is important. <laughs> it is important, yeah. <laughs> it's always kind of about a both end now, isn't it? Yeah, it is. yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what I experienced, uh, and I learned this within refuge recovery. It's not, it's not exclusive to that. And you and Scott have really effective, deeply worked out means for accessing um, the healing of what we're talking about here in terms of shame. <clears throat> I was introduced very early on within refuge recovery to uh, Buddhist forgiveness practice. And I, uh, 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 simply put, it, it, you, you take any situation, it kind of parallels making amends in the 12 step programs, except for me, it was much more full bodied. And so I did both. I, I worked through the 12 steps and I included in that, uh, uh, this forgiveness practice. And so I started practices, practicing this a little over five years ago, very early in recovery. And this is when I was abstinent now, so I was clear of mind. And I began uh, to address, uh, first of all, asking for forgiveness. This is in my meditation practice. It'd be part of my meditation practice every day. I would address, uh, if I've wronged you, Lynn, I would, I would ask for you, to, for anything that I've done to you or not done for you anything I've said to you or said against you, anything I've even thought about you or thought against you, I'd ask you for forgiveness in my mind's eye. And I would, uh, it wasn't wrote, it never was wrote for me, in fact, it began to fill out. I would want to, I would try to imagine what it felt like to you, let's say it's something I did to you. I try to imagine what it felt like to you and hold that as I'm asking for your forgiveness. So it's not some kind of cheap drive-by forgiveness. It's really, I really see what I've done and it's, very painful for me to have done this to you and to, and to ask for your forgiveness. And then in the forgiveness practice, you turn it around and then I have to, I have to think of anything that you've done to me or said to me or even thought about me. Sometimes I have to just imagine it. But if I know you well, we will have stepped on each other's toes inevitably. And I extend the same process to you, which is I have to, first of all, imagine what it felt like for you to say that to me, let's say. Mm -hmm. and I have to feel that in my body. This is, all, this is all very slow and embodied. And then I have to imagine how you could have come to say that. 
And so I've tried to imagine your interiority that would have informed you're doing something that if we're close to each other, wouldn't typify your behavior towards me. And so I, 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 I can imagine why you might've said that. And it's not to excuse you, but it's to, uh, it's to empathize. It's to allow, kind of open up a little bit more of the container to include compassion for you as well as for me. Both are there. And then I extend forgiveness to you. And then finally, and this is the piece de resistance, then, <laughs> is that I turn that back towards myself, and then I come back to the very things that I've said or done to you. And again, imagining what it felt like to you. And then I imagine why I could have done that, why I could have said that to you. And then I ask that I forgive myself. And so <clears throat> the first time I was introduced to this was by George Haas in uh, Refuge Recovery, and then later on in another workshop with Noah Levine. And uh, for whatever reason, of everything that I did, Lynn, of all the work that I did, including all the 12-step work, all the reading, all of the therapy, all, just all of the resources, this piece, this piece that we're talking about was the most significant to me. And it stands that way for me in terms of my own, my own recovery. And so I started doing it and I just did it every day. I meditated every morning, <clears throat> sometimes more than once a day. And I would include this forgiveness practice. I got it down to where I can do it in about five minutes. And I just move from one person to the next. Truly, what it does, it tends to hover around the most significant relationships in my life because that's where the bruises and the interactions are, the, the, the disjunctions and so on. And so I began practicing. And it wasn't just one time, but it was like every day for five years. And what I do know over the five-year process from where I started to now is that I assigned to this practice, and it could be, there's so many pathways to this. You'd have a pathway, Scott would have a pathway. This is my pathway that I've developed to being able to liberate, be, become liberated from that self-loathing and self-judgment and self-objectification that I was uh, completely victim to early in recovery. And I can tell you that I'm not recognizable to myself as of five years ago. I'm not even sure if I'm recognizable to two years ago because it continues to, to morph and change. One of my supervisors was Bonnie Badenoch and Bonnie talked about this in terms of interpersonal neurobiology. Bob, what you're doing, because she's also a, a, a deep adherent of mindfulness, you're rewiring your brain, Bob. She says you're building brain. She says you're building new neuronal networks. And that may or may not be true, but I definitely do not feel like the same human being. And so, and I, I want to be careful in talking about a methodology because I don't think this is reducible to method. In fact, what this does is this method kind of clears away all methods. It actually clears away the self-consciousness, the self-judgment until what there is, it's just kind of openness. And I'd have to, you'd have to ask others in my life to say, is it true what Bob's talking about? You could ask them and see. But I can tell you subjectively, I do have a sense of radical transformation, speaking of radical, radical transformation owing to this practice. And it's been a burden uh, of all burdens for me to bring this to others that I'm working with. The clients that I work with in coaching, the clients that I work with in groups, is we practice this almost every session. There's some variation on this kind of practice. My wish is, to, is, is for people to, to to, uh, for it to become habitual, because I think that the change is incremental, but I think that it is, it's like sedimentary letters like this, is that if you practice it, you will change. I think, uh, for me, I assign, um, this is like divine providence. I mean, this is, uh, you know, whatever, the grace. In fact, I, I present this uh, occasionally to Christian audiences, and I'll, I'll include in that last run through the forgiveness uh, for whatever I've said to you, Lynn. Uh, causing you harm, uh, with God's help, I forgive myself. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll say it explicitly because in that audience, it's particularly, it might be very important. I think it's presumed in my own practice that it's, that it's with however we understand that. So it's, right. wow. it, uh, it puts this shame and it's healing right in a psychological uh, frame because this is what the shamed, traumatized self can't do. The shamed child can't do anything but blame itself. It can't possibly get its hands around mom or dad doing this to them or a brother or sister or whoever it, 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 it traumatized. There's no way. It always has to be the, the, the child uh, that's, that's uh, blameworthy because otherwise the world falls apart. And so this is some way to deconstruct that and reconstruct, recreate something that's really uh, very different and life-giving. And I don't know how to separate that from psychological work and spiritual work, because they're, they're just they're like all this. intertwined there. And you know yeah. that I could I can feel the power of this just as you're talking about it. Thank you. And the question that I think is so interesting here is that you're looking at 
what was going on inside me that I could have said that or done that? Mm -hmm. and what was going on inside of the other person? Mm -hmm. So it's a deep mm -hmm. empathy practice. It's not just a, yes. oh yeah, I forgive you for saying that. You must mm -hmm. be stressed. But to really get mm -hmm. into what, it, what mm -hmm. would be the conditions under which someone mm -hmm. would say something like that mm -hmm. to someone they care about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for noting that. Uh, you know, if you practice something for five years, it begins to change <laughs> and hopefully to deepen. And what started as just the basic instructions, I just kept practicing it and it kept ramifying. It just kept, there kept being this piece. And this piece you're talking about is a later development somewhere along the way. It, it seemed like it was too easy to ask, uh, ask you for forgiveness. If I didn't feel, if I didn't imagine, and I mean really imagine feeling in my body what you must have experienced. And while that's painful to do, uh, it, it's essential, it seems like to me. And so with practice, that gets more and more easier and easier to do. You know what this makes possible, Lynn, is that if I offend you in real time, let's say right now, it makes me less hesitant to come to you because I'm, I'm not afraid of being with your pain. And, yes. and, and, I, and I can stay open in the presence of your pain so you can know that I care for you. In other words, I'm not, I'm not in a defensive mode. I'm actually heart open, even as I've hurt you, which is so painful to me. And you can see it in my eyes. You can hear it in my voice. And so this practice has helped inform me in present time relationships, just around making effective apologies, you know, in the moment. And that is the root of addiction, is trying to get away from these things yes. you can't be with. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. It's such an important element. Yeah. I just led a group yesterday at the treatment center and I, I called it, it was for the holidays and I called it making effective amends. Uh, and what I did is I, I broke down apology into six different components. I'm not going to share those right now, but I went through them with the group and we did it kind of inductively where we just kind of asked ourselves questions. What makes what makes an apology feel real to you, you know, is what I was asking. And I was listing them on the board and every, every answer was right because every one of them was relevant. And, and, then, and then we kind of talked through it more systematically because I had kind of uh, some thoughts to organize all of it. And a gentleman to the right said that the truth probably for all of us, he said, I have never said an apology that included any of these components. Oh. And I felt like that's the most honest comment somebody could make is what he was acknowledging was, I don't know how to make an apology. And so why, why wouldn't I want to uh, defend myself or numb out or whatever? And I, I think he got it. At the end of the group, it was so meaningful to me, Lynn. At the end of the group, he stood up and he's, he's been in several of my groups. He stood up, walked towards me and just shook my hand really warmly in a way that, that was unprecedented. And it was a function of something got transmitted there for both of us because i won't forget his his uh, his response either is that that's the way it is for all of us none of us learn this stuff in school in fact we learn to go away from this men are socialized otherwise women too and so it goes and so i feel like what we're doing is building some skills that can actually be um uh, prophylactic preventive in the future not only about healing past wounds and trauma but also about healing ruptures in the future because if i'm close to you i can't help but step on your toes occasionally and if i don't have any way to to heal or mend that then we're stuck with that crap it manifests as resentments and soon enough we can't talk to each other or we're blowing up at each other and so i need some tools for that too so yeah i have to say this lynn just and this is self-promotional but i just released a, a cd uh, in the last two weeks in time for the holidays. It's called The Freedom of Forgiveness, and it's, uh, it's available through my website. I Bob saw Weathers. that earlier. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll and and, and I want to I recommend people go to that because it's a fleshing out in, a, in, in an hour CD of what we've talked about uh, in terms of how you do this meditation. And I, uh, I, it's, I don't know if it's self, it is self-promotional, but it's about getting the word out there. I don't care. <laughs> I just want to get the word out there or somebody can write me about it or they can go to my website and find out because I've written a lot about this. I think that your website, you know, your resources through Killaby Center, mine through uh, bobweathers.com, also Integral Recovery Institute has a ton of resources. I'm very involved with uh, John Dupuy and, and uh, Guy Duplessis and Doug Prater with Integral Recovery Institute. There's a ton of resources out there that speak in this idiom that we're talking about right now. And I want people to access this stuff. You, you, you invited me to think of a, a, a phrase or what was a quote or a saying yep. that means a lot to me. And I love that question. What a great question. And I thought about that a lot. And I have a ton of 
different thoughts, phrases, and so on. But I tell you, a very kind of a more obscure thing came to me that's right at the heart of what we were talking about earlier. And I was talking about being in the hospital and that sense of being reduced to a nub and mm -hmm. finding liberation in that. And it's, it's a favorite poem of mine. It's just a brief snippet of a poem from Rumi. Mm -hmm. And you'll be familiar with it, but it means so much to me and it actually has been amplified by that earlier conversation. May I share it with you? Sure, yes. He, he says, how to cure bad water? Send it back to the river. <laughs> there is a secret medicine that is given only to those who hurt so hard that they give up all hope. The hopers would feel slighted if they knew. Mm. I was a hoper. I was a hoper. And, and I got hope knocked out of me. It knocked out of me in the way that T.S. Eliot talks about hope or faith getting knocked out of us. And in its place came something else. And I think it's the secret medicine. And it's, it's, it's somehow transmitted in our conversation now, the work that you do, that Scott does. I know, is because Scott is not a hoper. <laughs> and I mean that as highest compliment. I hope you hear the spirit in which yeah. I mean that. And I aim to be less and less of a hoper. <laughs> but in this, in this deeper spiritual sense is that the hope or the faith I would have would be infinitely less than what's possible. And one of the, one of the gifts of addiction and hitting bottom, and I do, I do invite conversation about this with the clients I work with, is can we hold out this liberation, this, can we hold out this possibility of, of something being cleared out that never has been before, and then use that as our premise or our foundation for how we move forward. It's one of these paradoxical things that gives me deep brotherhood and sisterhood with addicts who are in recovery that get this, and not all do, not all will, I, I fully get that, but those that do, and you do, and Scott does, John and Doug do with integral recovery, and I'm getting along in that, <laughs> is that there's something about this. I don't want to forget this lesson. It would be my great story. You remember how I told you in the hospital that I felt like I'll be nostalgic one day for this insight or this awareness. Mm -hmm. I don't want to live in nostalgia. I really want to live more and more into this hopelessness that really is the only foundation for authentic hope, it seems like to me. Does this make any sense, Lynn? Yeah, it totally does. Yeah. Oh, bless your heart. Thank you. It feels really good to share it with you. Thank you. All of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is there anything that we, that we haven't touched well, you know, on that just, matters that, a lot to you? Yeah, that's my last question. Is there anything that you, <laughs> <laughs> that you feel like you'd want to conclude this? I mean, there's been so much rich mm. conversation here. Mm -hmm. But is there anything, mm -hmm. you know, people are watching this, what might you really want to think? I'll share this. It's just it's it was evoked by your making a comment a while ago about listeners that are are themselves in recovery, and uh, I speak to such different audiences. I speak to therapists. I speak to recovery workers. I speak to clients. I speak to family members and so on. But speaking specifically to those of us that are in recovery, um, I really meant what I said earlier is that even though I can be critical of limitations within psychology or within the recovery self-help organizations, et cetera. I really hold to what I said to that one client uh, that I shared earlier, is that whatever combination of resources you can put together, that's, that's your unique formula for salvation, for recovery. And I really honor that. So please take everything that I've said that has a critical tone, take it please in the spirit in which it's given, which is it's only in seeking more um, dialogue between the disciplines and raising the water level but the key is your life or my life and it's i've shared with you i know that it's autobiographical what i've shared with you is some combination of all of this is working for me and if some part of it works for somebody take that and all the rest leave aside i really really hold to um, trusting your instincts and trusting your process to find your way with it. That's, that's the most important thing of all. It's not about psychology versus spirituality versus anything. It's about embracing as many, as many resources as you can and then finding your unique, uh, un your unique algorithm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I hope that that's helpful. I really do mean that for my heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the things that I noticed on your website was that you talked about making living amends. Mm -hmm. And I was so touched by that because it really is something we can all do. 
Mm, thank you. Wherever we are in our lives or recovery, or we can always work with that. Mm. And that's mm. such a um, a deep and heartfelt intention. I can feel thank that. Thank you. Thank you. I'll tell you a little story. Before we met today, a little while before, I was taking a shower and I was praying in the shower. I wasn't using those words, but that was the feeling of it. It's like, may whatever wants to come through today in re relation to you, I was looking forward to meeting you and I knew that you'd be a wonderful host and you are. Mm -hmm. But I was really hoping that I could get out of the way and that some something could come through that would touch somebody. And that's all about living amends. I, uh, mm -hmm. I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to make living amends and feel really dedicated to it. And I'm flawed, I'm limited, I make mistakes, but I really I really hope that nuggets would come through that would be, be of value. And, and you put your finger right on it, that's really in the spirit of yeah. living amends. Well, and part of our living amends is our own recovery. Yeah. And then part of it is what we yeah. share with others. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much. It's been great talking with you. Thanks for being on. You too, Lynn. Yeah, it's a real pleasure. Give my love to Scott, please, okay? I sure will. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. Many yeah. blessings to you. <laughs> you too. Go to killabycenter.com, Radical Recovery Summit. For access to the interviews, you can watch them free online for 48 hours after they air, or you could purchase an all access pass killabycenter.com.